Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Is it um Shyamala? Shyamala? I, I don't want to. Shyamala. You Shyamala. got it right the first time. Shyamala. Shyamala. Okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. Yeah, great having you here. Thank you. And we'll get started shortly. Sure. So I take it Adrian is uh, out doing his civic duty? He is. He is. <laughs> um, I think it's his third day doing this. Um, oh. But he's having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, uh, there was only one time that I was asked and I was in uh, school and I had to do, you know, I was doing some experiments or something. Then I said, okay, can't go. And that opportunity never came again. But I'd like to be on it. Maybe soon, maybe soon. Yeah. I, I was called one time and I waited in the lobby for eight hours. And then at the end of the day, they said, oh, well, we're done with uh, our services today. So you're free to go. And that was my experience. I guess you get points for showing up. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. I caught up on my reading too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Miles. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. It's Hi, Mariella. just make sure I'm in the right place at the right time. You can never yes. tell. Yes. <laughs> we'll get start started shortly, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And Shamala, you and Miles, you have hosting privileges as well, I believe. So. Okay. When you when you do want to share your slide, you can go ahead and share it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wait, I'm not going to use slides, but yeah, that's oh, totally fine. It's it's I'll just to visually uh, compelling with my face. Okay, I, I <laughs> very just compelling. Hit, I just hit the share screen, right? That should be. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Share screen at the very bottom. It's the green button. It should be. Sure. Mm -hmm. there. You want to test it out, Shamala? Sure. Great idea. Oh, and Mariella, hi, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. You can see this, right? Perfect. I think just have it in presenter mode. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I just want to make sure that you can actually see the slides. Perfect. Yeah. I see people trickling in. Hi, everyone. We'll get started shortly. Happy Thursday. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. We'll get started shortly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We'll wait about one more minute, see if and see if anyone's going to be joining us.
Hello, good morning. And I think good afternoon to those of you who are in the East Coast. Um, I dropped in the uh, chat below our agenda for today, but we'll get started today. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy, Kathy C. Chu from Valley Vision. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also supporting the Clean Air Partnership alongside my colleague, Adrian Wren. And unfortunately, Adrian won't be joining us today due to jury duty, but he sends his hellos and warmest regards. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Clean Air Partnership, um, the coalition was created in 1986 by the Sacramento Metro Chamber and Breathe California Sacramento Region. And Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. Um, it is currently a broad-based partnership, including business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts, all working together to help the six county region uh, protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for clean air. And I'm gonna drop in the chat a link to our Clean Air Partnership page to learn more about it if you're curious. Um, so we have regular virtual meetings to discuss different air quality related topics. And today's CAPTAC or Cleaner Air Partnership, Cleaner Air Partnership Technical Advisory Committee meeting is one of them. So I wanna, I wanna start off by, by saying a huge thank you to our event sponsors, the, the Sac Metro Air District, Tiger, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, Sacramento Association of Realtors, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District, El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, North State Building Industry Association, PG&E, CEMEX, and the Healthy Air Alliance. Um, so, so for today's conversation, we'd like to discuss the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or the acronym NACS, um, as changes to the standards uh, have significant impacts on our region. So, so some of you are probably wondering exactly what NACS is, and, and we're here to find out exactly what that is. And uh, for those of you who have who are just job, uh, jumping on, um, here is our agenda for today. Just wanted to share it again. If some of you have missed it, but um, Miles Keo will give us a one on one on next to start off our discussion, and then from there we invite all of our speakers to share their perspectives on what might be coming down from the EPA followed by an open Q&A where all are welcome to ask any questions or provide comments. Um, as a reminder, feel free to either raise your hand using the reactions tab below on your screen to be called upon to ask questions or, or enter your questions and comments in the chat box but it'll be where it'll be monitored and elevated to our speakers. Um, before I dive in, I wanna do a quick round table of introductions, um, just name and affiliation uh, would be great. And I'll call out each person in the room for intros. So let's let's begin. And then to my left, I have Richard, Richard Falcon. Hello, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you East Coast. Richard Falcon, lead organizer with United Latinos. Thank you, Richard. Wayne Linklater. Good morning, uh, Wayne Linklater. I'm a professor and chair of environmental studies at Sac State. Thank you, Wayne. Shamala Rajan. Shamala Rajan, uh, American Lung Association. Thank you, Shamala. Miles Keo. Hi, I'm Miles. I'm the guy in the corner office at the National Association of Clean Air Agencies in Washington, DC. Thank you, Miles. Eric White. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric White. I'm the Air Pollution Control Officer in Placer County here in California. Thank you, Eric. Earl Withicombe. Earl Withicombe, I'm an air quality advisor to United Latinos, currently working for the California Air Resources Board. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Mariela Racho. Hi, everyone. It's Mariela Racho from the American Lung Association. And I believe I have from SMUD, I can't see your first name, but it's last name Bacini. Hello, it's Emily Bikini with uh, SMUD. Good to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Mackenzie Weiser. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Weiser. I'm the CEO of Sacramento Splash and also a County of Sacramento uh, Climate Task Force member. Thank you, Mackenzie. Mark Ludenheiser. 
Morning, everyone. Mark Lautzenheiser, SAC Metro Air District, uh, Division Manager overseeing monitoring, planning, rules. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Susan Rainier. Uh, Susan Rainier, I'm with the AIA Central Valley. Thank you, Susan. Dimitri Gadomini. Oh, hey there, everybody. It's uh, Dimitri Gadomini with Cap City. Thank you, Dimitri. Ryan Tan. Morning, everyone. Ryan Tan from Smud Sustainable Communities. Thank you. Louis Bayer. Hi, this is Louis Bayer, Senior Director and Counsel of the Portland Cement Association Government Affairs Office in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Valentino Tianco. Valentino uh, Smud. Nice, thank you. Jennifer Fitton. Good morning, Jennifer Fitton, uh, Acting CEO for Breeze California, Sacramento Region. I am mobile today, so I'm gonna keep my video off. Sounds great, thank you, Jennifer. Roxana Garcia. Hi, this is Roxana with the Health Education Council. Thank you. Christina Zhang. Good morning, everyone. Christina Zhang, Project Manager with Civic Thread, formerly Walk Sacramento. Thank you. Sandra Hall. Sandra Hall with uh, University of California Davis Air Quality Research Center. Appreciate it. And Bree Taylor. Bree Taylor, Sacramento County Department of Airports. Mute. Oh, Jennifer, could you mute your, your screen? Jennifer, Finn, thank you. Uh, Rafe Porter. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, Rafe Porter, Transportation and Climate Change uh, Program Manager at Sac Metro Air District. Thank you. Mr. T. Jeffrey. Um, Sac True, uh, a uh, advocate. Thank you. Shaitra Ken. Hi, I'm Shaitra Ken. I am with Green Tech Education, which is a youth development organization um, in urban planning, I mean, urban agriculture, and I'm the program manager for them. Thank you. Let's see. Also, I don't know if Simeon is going to be on today, but so I'll just be here as a sure. Yeah, thank you for letting us know. Jenna Abbott. That's what I get for running into the room late. My apologies <laughs> for being late. I'm assuming we're doing introductions. We're doing roundtable introductions. Thank you, Jenna. Sure. I'm Jenna Abbott. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives for the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber and very pleased to be here. Yeah, just for those of you who have just joined, um, we're just doing a quick roundtable introductions. Just name and affiliation would be wonderful. Thank you. Let's go to Renee, Renee DeVere. Uh, Renee Devere Oki, Sacramento Area Council of Governments, uh, Program Manager for uh, Air Quality Planning. Thank you. And Paul Hensley? Yeah, there. Paul Hensley. I'm the Interim Air Pollution Control Officer at the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District. Thank you. Molly Johnson? Good morning. Molly Johnson with the Paso County Air Pollution Control District. Okay. Bill, thank you. Bill McGovern. Bill McGovern, Coalition for Clean Air. And then we have Mark Meeks. Mark Meeks with City Church of Sacramento. Thank you, Mark. And I, I believe that's it. And for, for those of you who are not aware, um, uh, or just uh, just again for, for a reminder for those of you who just uh, dropped on to this call, my name is Kathy Suchu and I'm a project associate with Valley Vision. Um, and Adrian Wren, who you all probably are familiar with, um, he won't be joining us today due to dirty duty, dirty duty but um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us today. Let's see. All right. So, so in the chat, I have the agenda for today. Um, as a reminder, feel free to either raise your hand using the reactions tab below on your screen or to be called upon for questions um, or, or enter your questions in the chat box where it will be monitored and elevated to our speakers. Um, so thank you everyone for your quick round table of introductions. Pleasure to meet you all. Um, now let's, let's get started and dive in. Um, I'm gonna hand over the mic to Miles to give us the next um, 101. Um, but followed by a brief Q and A with questions, um, and then um, you know, be, you know, before I start, I, I just wanted to let you all know um, that uh, that is Thursday, so it feels like Friday. But really, thank you all for joining us today. Okay, um, so go ahead, Miles. You have the floor. 
All right, rock and roll. Thanks for uh, spending time with uh, this topic today. It's one that's super near and dear to my heart. I was love engaging with folks from the uh, Golden State and from the Capital Region there. I always love it when Valley Vision has me come on in and talk to some of my my smartest and coolest friends. And uh, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with y'all from here in beautiful Washington, D.C., which is, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the other capital that we've got going on in this in this conversation. Uh, again, my name is Miles Keo. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, which convenes um, uh, 157 state, local, and territorial clean air agencies that implement the Clean Air Act. And several of the folks on this call here are actually NACA members and leaders and hearing some of the folks from Yellow Solano and Placer County and uh, uh, SAC AQMD and uh, uh, I kind of feel like they put the ball boy into, you know, play and they left Steph Curry on the bench. Uh, uh, certainly there are folks here who could uh, do much greater justice to what I'm going to talk about uh, with the NACs uh, and could get very deep geek uh, with you on this. I'm going to give you just sort of like a quick breezy spin through of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards or NACs. Um, but it's not really going to get into the heavy weeds, but we can do that later. Or, you know, many of you will be like, why? This is like reading Goodnight Moon. Um, but I'll do my best to make it interesting. I don't have a slide, so I'm going to try to be interesting with my face as well. And I appreciate y'all sticking with me. And if you have questions, you can stop me as I'm going to. So uh, the Clean Air in the National Association of Clean Air Agencies gets its name from the Clean Air Act, the awesome piece of legislation that Congress first passed in uh, 1970 and then updated in 1990. Uh, as part of the Clean Air Act, a core provision of it is that state, local, and federal agencies work in partnership to improve the quality of the air that people in our country breathe. Uh, they do that in a bunch of different ways, but one, one very key component of it is the articulation of uh, standards, ambient standards for six common harmful pollutants. They're called criteria pollutants, and uh, they include carbon monoxide, lead, particulates, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Those six criteria pollutants are the ones that are governed by the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And the Clean Air Act lays out a whole bunch of its institutional infrastructure uh, with the state, local, federal partnership around different pieces of meeting those health-based standards. So I just mentioned that the NACs are health-based, and it's important to understand that the NACs, the, the, the level that is set in that standard for each of those pollutants is set solely based on public health and welfare protection. Meaning that uh, while the agency uh, must consider in other areas, uh, including implementation, the best way to achieve those standards, that the setting of those standards, whether it's healthy or not, uh, is driven by public health considerations. Uh, and in the case of a secondary standard, which I'll get into, uh, envir environmental damages, but not based on uh, other kinds of, of concerns, uh, in particular um, uh, economics. Uh, also, the agency um, uh, uh, can't consider costs when it, it determines whether the standard that it set previously needs to be tightened. It considers only like the science-driven empirical health issues, health and welfare issues. The NAX is sort of like the, it's the Steph Curry, it's the cornerstone of EPA's work to protect uh, public health and the environment from air pollution. Uh, and before we get into kind of like what its, what its parts are and what its implementation is, I should just level with you. I'm a huge fan of the NAX. <laughs> uh, they have driven, um, uh, emissions of the of these harmful people and planet harming pollutants uh, in 40 years they've dropped 71 percent all while the economy grew 182 percent. The NACs have saved 
thousands, possibly millions of lives. And uh, they are good. Um, they are also complex. And so I'll get into some of how, how that works. Sometimes people don't are crazy about complexity uh, and we can, we can get into some of the nuts and bolts of that. So I mentioned the Clean Air Act, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, sections 108 and 109 of the Clean Air Act create this structure, it's like a calendar that requires EPA to go into the, to pop the hood on the NACs every five years to make sure that they're adequately protected, to review the science and go through a multi-stage robust review. Uh, and they use significant scientific input, both literature and scientific expertise um, uh, uh, in going through this, and they need to do it every five years. When they look at the science, they determine whether a standard needs to be tightened. And it's at the administrator's discretion with the scientific input, whether a standard needs to be tightened. If a, if a determination's made that a, the standard needs to be made more protective, that the science says the level of ambient exposure uh, set by this, by this standard is inadequately protective. If that happens, then there's this cascading effect on air quality programs and policies that happen around the country. And that's really where folks uh, who are on this call who are NACA members come in, because they then have to take actions to ensure that the sources of pollution in their jurisdictions decrease their emissions so that the area that isn't meeting the necessary standard can meet the new, more protective standard. The feds have a role in this too. There's some things that the local agencies or that the state agencies have control over, but uh, for our most for a number of sources, uh, uh, with the exception of California, for uh, mobile sources, for example, New York can't tighten down on the emission standards for vehicles or uh, uh, set manufacturer standards for, say, trucks, um, trains, planes, things like that. We can get into mobile source standard setting in, uh, at a later moment, but anyways. Um, uh, but essentially, the things that are within the jurisdiction's control, once an axe has been set, those state and local agencies come up with plans to, to meet those standards by creating emissions reductions in their jurisdictions. I mentioned that there are two kinds of standards, primary standards, which are driven by health impacts to public health. Um, Susan, I may not get to that, but we can get to that in discussion. Uh, there's primary and then there's secondary, which have to do with welfare and that have to do with uh, 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 environmental effects as well. Uh, for carbon monoxide, which is something that we get a lot from cars, uh, there's a primary standard uh, where there's exposure limits every for eight hours of exposure and for one hour of exposure. For uh, lead, this also comes from different mobile sources a lot, in the ambient air domain. Um, there's primary and secondary standards that are on a rolling three month average. And, and that NAX has been a, a big driver in why we don't have leaded gasoline anymore. There's still uh, uh, kinds of fuels that have lead in them and we can discuss that later. Uh, for nitrogen dioxide, for NO2, there are one hour and one year standards. Um, for ozone, there is a primary and secondary standard that's set at eight hours. I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. Uh, that standard was tightened in 2015. It gave uh, uh, folks a few years to, to reach the new standard. It was tightened from 75 parts per million to 70 parts per million. And ground level ozone um, uh, comes from a bunch of different places, power plants, stationary sources, vehicles, uh, uh, and other kinds of, of emissions. Uh, there are uh, a couple kinds of particle pollution that fall into the next pollutant. Um, these particles, they're made of all kinds of different stuff. Uh, they can be uh, uh, droplets or they can be um, uh, little tiny bits of debris. And when I say tiny, I mean really tiny. Uh, one of them, PM10, is 
uh, 10 microns in width. Uh, one of them, PM 2.5, is 2.5 microns in width. You could fit uh, 100 PM 2.5 particles in the width of a human hair. So these penetrate deep into the lungs. And there's a lot of studies that show that uh, PM10 and PM2.5, along with ground level ozone and, and other things, but, but that the major uh, air polluter that uh, pollutant that causes uh, human mortality, shortens people's lives in this country and in countries like India and China and elsewhere, that PM2.5 is really a killer and uh, uh, has garnered a lot of uh, pollution reduction attention. There are uh, primary and secondary short-term and longer-term uh, standards for exposure to PM 2.5 and exposure to PM 10. Um, and uh, those standards are undergoing tightening right now. Uh, we'll see if the administrator uh, tightens those up and, and um, lowers the standard, uh, but there's a, a widespread expectation that we'll see that in the next you know, few weeks or months. Uh, and then the last one is sulfur dioxide. There's a one hour and a three hour primary and secondary standard for that. Sulfur dioxide comes from a bunch of different places, but the big dog in the SO2 uh, situation is coal-fired power plants. So, thanks for sticking with me so far. Within a year of setting a revised standard, states and tribes have to submit recommendations uh, to EPA about whether or not they're able to meet that standard, whether they're already meeting it. When they say recommendations, uh, they use ambient air quality data that they collect over a period of time uh, that demonstrates that they're either on an ambient basis above or below uh, the standard. Um, we'll get into monitoring in just about 10 seconds, but we'll come right back to that. What happens is that EPA reviews those and then makes determinations about whether uh, they agree that that uh, that jurisdiction that's served by that state or local agency or sometimes tribe uh, meets those standards. Um, and then they designate whether uh, an area is in attainment or is in non-attainment. And some of the most stubborn and durable non-attainment areas in the country are right there and not exactly where you are, but right in your backyard in, uh, in California. And so this is not a moral problem. This is not we're dirty, we have pollution, we shouldn't do that so much because you well know that California is a leader in reducing emissions and in uh, pioneering uh, uh, clean air to the best of its ability. Um, it's a complex situation that comes both from emission sources and policies, but also things like meteorology and terrain and things like that. So uh, uh, it's really a problem that we all need to work on together. Uh, if the if the air quality in an area is uh, better than the standard, then it gets designated as attainment. Uh, if it's worse, then it's designated as non-attainment. If the data is not there, it's designated as unclassifiable, and they come on back and figure it out with you uh, going forward. Once you're designated, those state and local governments with non-attainment areas have to develop these implementation plans that outline how they're going to get to attainment, how they will attain and maintain those standards by reducing pollutant emissions of those things that they have the authority to reduce over. Um, and you guys are probably well familiar with the kinds of uh, programs that have been advanced in your area to move you towards attainment. Uh, they make that plan, they turn it into EPA, and then once EPA approves all or part of the SIP, of a state implementation plan, the control measures that are outlined in that plan become enforceable in a federal court. So it's a big deal to include them and it's a big deal to approve them. If a state or an agency fails to submit an approvable plan or if EPA says, we disapprove this, it's not what we need, uh, then that opens the door for EPA to develop a FIP, a federal implementation plan where EPA develops the plan and implements it on that jurisdiction, requires those reductions from, uh, from that jurisdiction. If an area goes out of attainment, it can result in some, some, some penalties that are structured into the Clean Air Act. 
Specifically, it can lose different kinds of federal funding, like highway funding, uh, and it faces different kinds of um, federal permitting limits and requirements as well. It gets a lot more complicated if you go into non-attainment. Um, and then once you implement your measures and you want to get back into attainment, to get back into attainment, you have to demonstrate that the air quality now me meets the standard, but then also you have to demonstrate that the way that you've met that standard comes from real reductions. In other words, it can't just be caused by, we lucked out on the weather. Uh, it can't just be caused by, we had a pandemic and things shut down and now they're turning back on. Um, and uh, uh, to stay, to be re, uh, return to attainment, um, EPA also has to approve a plan that outlines how that jurisdiction will keep the air healthy for 20 years going forward. The last thing I'll talk about is monitoring and measurement. The way that um, attainment and non-attainment and maintaining attainment and all these, are we meeting the standard? The way it's measured, it's important to remember, these are not tailpipe standards. These are not smokestack standards. These are ambient air quality standards. There's monitoring stations that are extremely well calibrated, a little bit expensive, um, but they can tell with extreme precision and with like courtroom durable robustness what the um, what the air pollution is like uh, for these these criteria pollutants. And there's other kinds of devices out there that look at air toxics and that look at emerging contaminants and stuff like that too. But we have a very specific and well designed uh, set of requirements for these ambient air quality monitoring stations. I think CARB runs a lot of them in California. I think the locals run some of them as well. Folks from Sacramento and Placer and the like can, can straighten me out who's running what. I know that for some of the counties like uh, Mendocino and Lake, Lass and some of the other ones, CARB does the work. Um, the feds set these things called federal reference methods or federal equivalent methods uh, that, that lay out how you have to build your station what kinds of technologies are useful, how you do your sampling, how you do your analysis, and how that uh, goes into decision-making around air quality. Um, and as you can probably imagine, it's really expensive to go out of attainment. It's really expensive to, to uh, have uh, a return to attainment. Folks will spend an awful lot of money to return to attainment. But more importantly, getting to attainment is something that we really, um, uh, it protects all the people in those jurisdictions. Uh, we, get, we get concerned to a great degree about vulnerable communities, and we do need to sharpen the pencil on how we uh, protect uh, overburdened communities. But, but as a, a kind of a broad measure of our success, um, our protection for everyone is is measured and improved by uh, these national ambient air quality standards. They're good, and um, we should continue to rely on strong, empirical, science-driven bases for developing these standards uh, and for working together to achieve them. I'm happy to take questions. I saw in the chat that Sacramento mentions that they run their own monitoring network. I know South Coast runs their own. I think Bay Area runs their own. Um, uh, uh, so thanks for that that input. It you know it varies in the country based on who has what resources and who has what um, kinds of concerns and where the science drives you as well. Thank you for that. Are there any questions before we open things up for kind of stakeholder discussion? There was a question in there about what happened under the Trump administration with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And I'll just mention that uh, the cycle of, uh, are these standards protective enough did come up in the last administration. And the administrator at the time, Andrew Wheeler, determined that both for ozone and for particulates, that the existing standards were adequately protective. Um, there were also some things that were done during the last administration uh, that, um, I will say candidly, uh, aimed 
to change the way that science was used in determining uh, the health-based standards in ways that NACA came out vociferously and strongly against. Uh, we saw it as an attack on science uh, or an attack on the use of science for public health dri driving policymaking. And along with the American Lung Association, a lot of other people uh, CARB and, and others, we really went to the mat to oppose that. Um, the current EPA administrator has gone back and taken a look at those things. And they're, as I said, they're, they've redone the assessment for particulates and they're taking a look right now at, at whether they're gonna redo it for ozone as well. So um, uh, that process went through a little bit of bumpiness in the last administration and it's, it's an ongoing uh, discussion now. Richard has his hand up. Thank you, Miles. Hey, Richard. Hey, Miles. Thank you for the presentation. And first, let me um, uh, qual qualify what I'm about to ask is I'm not a scientist. I'm an organizer with United. Me Electronics neither. I'm a utility economist. You're, you're, so yeah, go yes. ahead. We'll, and, we'll and, and, I'm, and, and I'm primarily, you know, an artist who also organizes. So, you know, cool. think about that from my, my baby organizer heart. So, Please, I'm just going to ask the question. Yeah. What I've noticed over my time in organizing and working under air quality monitoring and the work that we United Latinos and others in Sacramento do here, one of the questions that's always come to my mind when it comes to defining these standards that we're looking to achieve and the and and trying through the data to also assess based on the implications of health where we're gonna kind of set those, you know, on there. So, but when you talk about something like, and I'm just gonna throw it out there, lead. Everyone realizes any amount of lead is really not a good thing. Yeah. So when you have something like that, where do you get the data or the decision to actually apply a standard to something that people know should not even be there? It's a great question. Okay, so essentially you're asking the question like um, about uh, uh, the term of art for this is thresholds of harm. Is there a level, is there a threshold below which uh, you can or can't tell whether it's safe enough? Essentially, uh, essentially, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a complex question that I'm not gonna be able to answer super well. Uh, what they do in determining the standards is uh, they evaluate strictly on a health-based level uh, what is what does this what does the literature and the scientific research say is uh, a level at which there's adequate protection. The, it's not going to protect everybody. Uh, there'll be vulnerable individuals uh, who are more vulnerable. Um, but without getting too deep in the weeds, it is driven by science and it is driven by the notion of adequate protection. And I think, you know, the courts and the law does its best to try and figure out what the word adequate means. And I think that that's an area that in this country, we are blessed with the ability to have that argument and to, and to settle it out. Uh, but we're also lucky enough that we've got this, this dominion that's where we use science to answer that question as best as we can. And then we use human wisdom to carry us as far towards the best possible outcome we can get for people writ large. And again, there are gonna be vulnerable communities that need, we need to sharpen our pencils. We need to do better to, to uh, 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 really kind of achieve some of the successes we've seen for everybody on average. We gotta do better for uh, disproportionately burdened communities uh, we're also seeing improvements, but but that's where the next big push of work uh, goes. It's unfinished work. Thank you for that, Miles. And then also Susan Rainier has um, a question or a comment in the chat below as well. And just to let you know, uh, we, we do have open discussion time as well, um, set aside about 20 to 25 minutes. So um, if you wanna address this, Susan or Miles? Yeah, Miles, Susan, please. this is a great question. Susan's question is about federal setbacks from freeways so that you get space between freeways and residential communities. Um, I think I think we're uh, 
there's two pieces of this. One is different people will make different decisions in different places. If you go to Houston, you'll see like giant oil tanker farms right next to people's houses and churches and supermarkets and the like in a way that you wouldn't see in other parts of the country. Some of that's a function of the decision making that's been left to uh, local governments, state governments and others, uh, or you know the limits of federal jurisdiction about things like land use. Uh, air quality people don't have any jurisdiction over land use. This is not a thing that the law doesn't let us do that. Um, and other people are equipped in that space. The other question though is, um, uh, uh, so, so some of it's this question about uh, who gets to make those, those kinds of choices. The other question is though, uh, uh, what's sufficiently safe? And this kind of segues out from Robert's uh, comment, which is that one of the great things about this job is you will never learn all of it. Uh, every week I read dozens of health studies and every week my knowledge of the ways that air pollution harms people's health increases. We're learning more and more about the ways that air pollution affects people. The science is constantly uh, in exciting and sometimes pretty scary ways uh, growing about its relationship to diabetes and dementia, Alzheimer's and brain disease and lung disease and all kinds of stuff. Um, and as we learn more that that trickles out into things like our land use decisions that again, not air quality people, but that our government representatives try to work with society to, to produce better outcomes in. Thank you. Great questions, everyone. Thank you, Miles, for that very um, informative overview of NACS. And, and we'll hear more from Miles um, about NACA, which is the National Association of Clean Air Agencies soon. Um, but let's get into our next item for the, for the agenda today. And that is a lightning round of perspectives from our speakers. And so I'm going to pass it on to Shamala, and you have the floor. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, I have a couple of slides which I want to show. Uh, See. Folks can see this. All right, thank you. So uh, I'm going to provide a few perspective, perspectives from uh, the American Lung Association. And I'm speaking from Washington DC and my colleague, uh, Mariella is uh, in California. So together we'll uh, cover a few things. So following on uh, what Mike said, uh, here is a very simple and very simplified graphic uh, that ties in with um, the criteria air pollutants for which uh, EPA sets the National Ambient Air Quality Outdoor Standards uh, uh, as required by the Clean Air Act. So this graphic actually ties in both the criteria pollutants that we are interested in and working on right now uh, as part of our advocacy, but it also includes uh, um, your greenhouse gases. So um, the, the source for both of them is the, is the primary source is the same, which is uh, uh, burning of fuels, anything combustible. Um, so for instance, you know, natural gas, uh, some of the fossil fuels, natural gas, uh, coal, petroleum, um, that would include gasoline or diesel. So natural gas is uh, primarily methane. And when you burn that, you get uh, you know, carbon dioxide. Methane in itself is a greenhouse gas and it produces carbon dioxide, which is another greenhouse gas. But in the process, it, also, it could also produce carbon monoxide, which is a criteria pollutant for which uh, EPA sets an act, uh, and also particulate matter. Uh, as Miles mentioned, you know, particle physical matter um, that could be uh, either solid like soot, or it could be suspended liquid particles. Um, and the combustion of fuels also, uh, fossil fuels also causes uh, uh, the emissions of uh, sulfur, anything that has sulfur, carbon, nitrogen will give rise to oxides. So sulfur oxides, uh, then you have nitrogen oxides. Uh, nitrogen, sulfur oxide, uh, sulfur dioxide is a criteria air pollutant. Uh, nit nitrogen oxides are large numbers and one of them is nitrogen dioxide which is a criteria pollutant. And it also includes nitrous oxide, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And nitrogen oxides are precursors to ozone, which is a criteria pollutant. So this is a very simplified graphic, which I had used before, and I thought I, I'd share. Um, okay, so burning fuels produce all these emissions of criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases. 
So what are the major sources? So they could be stationary sources uh, or mobile uh, and mobile sources. So stationary sources would include uh, um, industries, power plants, even indoor appliances. And uh, mobile sources include on-road, off-road, non-road uh, traffic, the automobiles that you see on the highways and marine vessels, uh, air traffic, trains, farm equipment, lawn equipment. Uh, and of course, you have wildfires. Wildfires produce both particulate matter and also nitrogen uh, oxides. And then you have, for particulate matter, you have uh, road dust and construction. And um, uh, uh, lightning. Lightning is a huge source of uh, nitrogen oxides. And, and the reason I showed the previous slide was uh, the criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases actually have uh, impact each other. And greenhouse gases, um, climate change uh, actually um, changes, uh, contributes to uh, changes in uh, criteria air pollutant levels and also their impacts. Um, and then, um, so as Miles mentioned, uh, there are a whole host of uh, um, health impacts uh, that these criteria pollutants cause. And for particulate matter, there's no such thing as uh, um, a safe level. But again, um, as was discussed, we base it on what science says is acceptable. Um, and, and particles of all sizes are harmful to health. They cause a whole host of morbidities uh, or exacerbate existing uh, conditions, you know, anything from respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological, developmental issues. Uh, um, and um, related illnesses. And they also increase the risk of mortality. The same thing for ozone. Ozone is a very powerful oxidant. It's essentially like a household bleach and kills cells on contact and cause uh, sunburn uh, um, of lung tissues. So uh, who are the vulnerable populations? It affects everybody, nobody is exempt, but it affects some people more than the others. So some uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups are children whose uh, lungs are uh, still developing, and older folks whose lungs are not as robust as uh, you know they used to be. Pregnant women and their fetuses, and that's a unique stage of life. Uh, people of color and people of low income. Uh, these kind, uh, the disparity, economic disparity and racial uh, uh, differences. They. Um, um, that those are also uh, are important to consider because uh, uh, those demographics are act, those uh, folks generally tend to live uh, where no other uh, uh, you know with uh, near sources of uh, major sources of pollution like industries uh, um, power plants or uh, highways uh, because they cannot afford to not to be uh, living in such situations. And then people who are with pre-existing uh, you know, illnesses. Um, and, and of course, people who work, uh, who spend a lot of time outdoors, either for work or for exercise. So all those are, are more vulnerable than uh, uh, other groups. Um, as uh, Miles mentioned, uh, right now, uh, EPA is looking at uh, 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 several criteria pollutants. Uh, and this is, I thought uh, I'd show this because uh, this is like the traffic light, the green one on top, the prime, uh, the fine particulate matter, the PM 2.5, it's at the end stage of uh, EPA uh, proposal, which is at OMB, the Office of uh, Management and Budget at the White House. So it's um, due to be, um, move my screen, this read words there. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's at OMB and soon to be uh, proposed. We don't know what they're going to propose, but that proposal, uh, what EPA proposed has been sitting at OMB for, you know, since August 25th or something. So as was mentioned, um, there are primary healthcare, uh, health-based standards and human, human health standards and secondary human welfare standards. At the Lung Association, we uh, are interested in the primary standard. For particulate matter, you have the 24-hour standard, the daily standard. At uh, So the numbers uh, that I'm showing here in red are what we are, uh, are asked is of EPA for the current review. Uh, that for the 24-hour standard, uh, currently it's at 35 micrograms per cubic meter, and our ask is 
25. Uh, and for the one year long term standard, it's uh, currently at 12, and our ask is of eight. And, the, and um, for the, uh, trend, the daily standard, we are also asking for the 99th percentile, not the 98, so that you'll have uh, fewer exceedances that are acceptable. And the numbers that we are, uh, these numbers uh, were actually based on scientific uh, uh, consensus. Um, when EPA, so uh, the NACs are set based on science. What does the science say? And part of the process of standard setting involves uh, um, a review of EPA's assessment of science by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. And these numbers that we are uh, shown in red, the ones we are asking for, are actually the ones at the lower end of the ranges recommended by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee or the KSAC. Um, and for ozone, um, it's in the yellow. It's still uh, in discussions with the KSAC. In fact, they're meeting uh, on next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, the current standard is the eight hour standard uh, at um, uh, 70 parts per billion and uh, calculated at the annual fourth highest daily maximum average over three years, and we are asking for a 60 parts per billion. In fact, the 60 parts per billion was actually uh, the lower end of the rec recommended range by the previous uh, KSAC uh, back when they set in uh, the current standard in 2015. So um, uh, because it's uh, science-based, whatever the science says is ac acceptable and adequate to protect uh, uh, majority of the population is what we are uh, asking for and apply a marginal, adequate margin of safety to protect vulnerable group groups. Uh, and uh, uh, down the pike will be um, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, it's still at EPA, but the, the talk is that it's going to be reviewed uh, uh, early next year. And uh, so uh, what's our perspective? So we have had uh, at Lung Association, we have uh, um, we advocate for uh, uh, clean air, um, including stronger NACs uh, and not only promulgation of uh, strong standards, but also fully implementing and enforcing them. Um, and our work is essentially all science based, and we are um, we advocate for standards that uh, the science shows to be protective. Uh, we actually sued the previous administration uh, for the decision not to update the standards uh, um, earlier in the previous uh, uh, three, four years ago. And we also petitioned EPA to reconsider their, uh, 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 not to re uh, revise the standards. So we are currently engaged uh, for PM, we are currently engaged in every part uh, of the NACS process. Uh, we work in coalition with public health and medical organizations. We submit detailed uh, written comments, uh, provide oral testimonies. We recruit additional health experts and um, people with personal stories of health impacts uh, that could be effective advocates. We educate and engage our, um, just a second, I can't see, uh, engage with public and uh, we produce fact sheets. In fact, if you go to lung.org, we can see all the fact sheets on all the criteria pollutants. And we also write blogs. Uh, we had one on redlining and the the um, the the um, the health pollution, uh, the air pollution burden on uh, 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 redlined uh, areas and uh, populations that live there. And um, we also drive public petitions that uh, online that we have uh, uh, on our website. We also hold interviews with uh, media and do outreach on social media. And we have met with uh, the uh, OMB at the White House for um, uh, to provide additional uh, comment. So um, that's how we engage uh, in uh, our ask for stronger NACs. So I'll pass it on to Mariella. Thank you, Shamala. Hi, everyone. This is Mariella Racho um, from the Lung Association. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit, uh, bring it up more local to what's happening in California and in the region. So our state of the air report um, comes out every springtime. Um, the report gives a national national grades on um, 
how we meet our air quality standards by county and metro area. This report goes through um, ozone and particle pollution because they're more, they are the more widespread um, pollutants. Um, so the latest report found that California continues to have the worst challenge, the most challenging air pollution in the in the nation. Um, Cal as you can see, California cities dominate the most, uh, the top 10 list for uh, for uh, the pollutants. So ozone, six California cities are top 10 for um, ozone for 24 hour pollutants, eight California cities are top 10 and then so on. Um, bringing it down more to Sacramento, which is where I'm at, um, the Sacramento Roseville area is number seven for short term particle pollution and number nine for ozone. It didn't make the top 10 for annual particle pollution, but it doesn't fall far behind. Uh, it's just number 11. Um, so as you can see, and then um, who is impacted in California in terms of air quality? 90% of Californians are impacted by um, bad air pollution um, and then and then for the communities the more uh granular level of like who is at experiencing the worst air pollution um our report also found that over three times more like communities of color are over three times more likely to experience the worst air pollution compared to other um communities and counties with um less uh, people of color. Um, and so next slide. And then, so Miles talked uh, about the um, 2015 ozone. I just wanted to touch a little bit on that. The, so like Miles said, once new air quality standards are approved, states and air districts come up with a plan on how to meet them and comply with the standards called the state implementation uh, plan. Um, I did want to touch on one of the implementation plans. Um, so in September, the board uh, approved the SIP, which included um, the for ozone, which included measures on how to meet the 2020, 2015 ozone standards. Um, CARB look, looks to see how what tools they have in their belt and how to meet this um, federal ozone standard. So some of those regulations that they included and approved in the SIP was the um, advanced clean fleets rule, the zero uh, emission trucks measures, and then the locomotives rule. Some of the other um, measures that were included were um, regulating uh, off-road diesel fleets and then overall off-road vehicles, and then also transitioning um, space and water heaters to zero emissions. And then to touch a little bit more on something that was discussed earlier on um, community planning and city planning, they did include um, something on vehicles miles travel, um, targets to reduce vehicles miles travel. Um, that does touch on how we plan our cities and there is a correlation on if we plan our city smart, we can reduce um, pollutants, especially ozone and particle pollution, and make and and help to help meet uh, these air quality standards. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to touch on that very quickly. And uh, I think you could go to the next slide. Here's our contact information, and just open it up to discussion. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Shamala and Mariella. And, and I was just wondering, um, will this PowerPoint or the slide deck be made available and so we can share it with our guests? Great. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Appreciate it. Really amazing seeing all the advocacy work on NACS um, with the American Lung Association. So thank you for that perspective. Um, and uh, uh, before we move on, I just I'm aware that maybe we have a representative for from the Portland Cement Association. Yes. Hi. Hi, Hi. Uh, Louis, uh, do you think you can kind of give a little brief introduction and maybe give your perspective on um, forthcoming NACS updates? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for, for having me on today. So I'm Louis Baer. I'm the uh, Senior Director and Counsel uh, with the Portland Cement Association in D.C. We represent uh, the vast majority of cement, America's cement manufacturers. 
um, you know, in California, we have nine plants. We have 95 plants uh, um, throughout the country. Um, so in 33 states, uh, facilities, uh, other facilities, terminals, and other facilities in all 50 states. So I'm happy to kind of give kind of a brief uh, uh, industry perspective. Uh, I didn't bring slides, um, so my apologies for that. But um, so, you know, we've, you know, I only can really speak for the, the cement industry, uh, not uh, the whole, uh, entire industry as a whole, but as the cement industry, we feel that, uh, you know, we are, you know, we have very extensive, uh, very uh, significant PM standards that we comply with through our Portland Cement uh, NESHAP, the uh, emission standard for hazardous air pollutants is PM, uh, particular matter particularly is uh, um, a, uh, surrogate for for metallic caps. We're also heavily regulated for for NOx and uh, SO2, NOx and SOx and SO2 through our uh, through our per Title Five permits. Um, so we're we're as an industry we're a very well controlled source, and so have been very involved in um, you know all in partnership also with some other uh, industry industrial associations here in DC. On advocating on the various NACs, the ozone and PM NACs that are uh, undergoing review uh, reconsiderations at this point. Um, so, you know, our perspective mainly has been that, you know, in terms of the um, the science that um, there's still really that since the 2020 final recon uh, final uh, decision by the Trump administration that really the science hasn't changed that much to really warrant. Uh, warrant additional uh, lowering of the PM next. Um, there's significant in the IAT in the integrated scientific assessment, there's uh, uh, significant uncertainty in terms of uh, uh, the ample margin of safety analysis. And that um, you know and as an in, in as an industry, there's um, because we you know we have state of the art bag houses that can to control our PM emissions. We have uh, SNCR to uh, lo reduce our NOx. We we take extensive uh, controls to mitigate dust and PM at our quarries that mine the limestone that's necessary for our process. That we're taking all the relevant controls into into account when we are for for these pollutants. And so that you know when you look at uh, a pollutant like like PM, especially in California, is that, you know, especially if the EPA is looking at a, a standard that's setting at, at an eight, um, you know, micrograms per cubic meter, um, especially in, in California, where there are a huge, uh, lots of incidents of forest fires and other just natural PM background that you're going to get into a situation where if you lower it to an eight, you're basically at the level of background PM and it's gonna it's gonna be a very complex to figure out how to you know bring out additional controls of uh, for to reduce pollution from you know well controlled sources like the cement industry, but also trying to look at kind of novel and new sources, um, you know non point sources, um, you know small small businesses small businesses so it gets very um, complex. And so, you know, just as an, you know, is kind of the cement industry, um, we're, you know, trying to, you know, we are working with, you know, we have been a stakeholder in the process and are advocating for um, that, you know, with just with the uncertainty in the science um, that EPA really should, should continue to retain both the uh, PM and ozone standards. Thank you, Louise. Oh. Um, do, do you have some time for to entertain some questions? Or I, I know you might be out of time right now. Um, I have a few minutes I can uh, I can stick on, but yeah, I'm gonna have to jump off for an association call in a few minutes. Sure thing. If does anyone have any questions for for about Portland Cement Association? Okay, I don't think so. Well, well, well. Thank you so much for joining us um, for making this call and. Um, speaking a little bit about perspectives from the cement industry. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And then let's see um, if we don't have any further questions. 
Uh, let's move on to Miles. Um, do you think you can speak a little bit more about National Association of Clean Air Agencies and your individual position and perspectives on NACS updates? Uh, it's, a, it's a marketplace of ideas out there. Uh, ALA has their ideas, Portland Cement has their ideas, and uh, uh, I think NACA is a community of people whose work is to advance the protection of clean air for all and to improve the capability and effectiveness of our agencies as they do the work of implementing the Clean Air Act. We have opinions on it too. Uh, we want it to be done skillfully. We want it to be done in a way that's driven by science. We need our agencies to have the resources to meet the requirements that the Clean Air Act creates for them uh, and to do whatever we can to protect the people who we're charged with protecting and serving. So, um, you know, I don't think that that always puts us on the same side of the field as the Portland Cement Association. I don't think that always puts us on the same side of the field as the American Lung Association. Uh, these are complex processes in public policy. Ain't anybody said it was gonna be easy. Uh, so um, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity and any opportunity to engage with, uh, with the other folks who spoke today and also especially to engage with experts like yourselves who are out there trying to make this work out there in uh, uh, places like California's capital region. Thanks, Miles. And I see Mr. T. Jeffrey has his hands up. Um, I thought that was a reminder there of the question. For California, we have had a lot of, should we say, wildfires. And because we are so large, um, how are we going about gauging what wildfires have an impact on our um, the air we breathe. Uh, just wondering is, is have we figured out whether you know a simple analysis will assist us or do we have a standard or do we have where we can go back 20 years and take a, an idea of when we had a last series of wildfires occur and what air pollutants increased or changed and the dynamic makeup of it. Just wondering whether we have done enough research in that bit to understand um, somewhere, and particularly because we consider climate is changing, what the adverse impact that um, is having on our on our air. Thank you, um, and that's really opened up to any of our speakers to speak upon. So feel free Come to. On, Mario, do you guys mind if I go first? So yeah, uh, great question. It's having an impact on your air. Uh, it's not great. It's bad, it's really bad. I think one of the major concerns we have about uh, the climate crisis is that it's undermining hard fought gains uh, for improving air quality, uh, for improving the public health outcomes. You know, we cleaned up our cars, we cleaned up our power plants. There's more work to do in those spaces, but we've, we've done a lot already. Uh, and, and five, 10, 12 years ago, uh, folks were not talking about undermining the NACs caused by uh, uh, wildfires as a as a concern of the climate crisis. We we're more focused back then on on other known unknowns and known knowns like sea level rise and other kinds of things like that. So it's a great example of how things can come out of uh, 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 the wings of the, the things and and take real center stage about it. As for the health impacts of of uh, the wildfires. Uh, there's a ton of research going on about it. Uh, uh, a lot of what we're learning about the public health impacts of uh, air pollution in the United States is being driven by some really fantastic research work that uh, is trying to help us get ahead of this wildfire situation. It doesn't, it doesn't totally parlay into using the NACs to improve the air pollution for air pollution situation for everyone. Um, but it's you're you're dead on. It is a huge concern, and it is a growing one, and one that we need to get ahead of and stay ahead of. I think Eric White might have wanted to answer this question, and I think I might have cut him off. Eric, do you want to answer this question? I, I don't know if I'd say I wanted to to answer it, but I'll I'll add to what you you said, Miles. Um, I have two answers to to your question. There, one is a very technical one as it relates to how the Clean Air Act works, and that's when there's a wildfire as a 
as an agency responsible for attaining and maintaining the NAC, there's a process for us to exclude those emissions, which EPA and the Clean Air Act would say are episodic, exceptional. And so as it relates to the NACs, the NACs really doesn't take those emissions into account and it doesn't take the air quality impacts from wildfires into account when it looks at whether or not the region meets the standards that EPA sets. The American Lung Association reports on um, state of the air do take those emissions into account, but the, the legal process for, the, for attaining the NACs does not. And as Miles said, I think as we all appreciate, that's a very bureaucratic process. The real answer is there are significant health impacts from wildfires. And we've seen over the last 10 years, those impacts growing. And I'll just point out two studies that recently came out um, that look at those issues. One is a study from Stanford, which concluded, I believe, and I hope I don't mix these up and I'll, I'll send them to Kathy and she can send them around after the call. Um, but it looks at wildfire emissions in the context of air quality gains and emission reduction programs here in California. And it's concluded that the wildfires we've seen over the last decade pretty much have eroded all of the air quality gains that we've seen when those happen. And so that's that's huge. You know, there's a lot of the, the gentleman from the Portland Cement Company certainly can attest. There's a lot of investment that has gone on from, from businesses from improvements in fleets in terms of the tailpipe emissions from their cars and trucks, um, which gets negated when we see these wildfires. And we know they're coming and they're worse every year. Um, and so it's something we need to figure out what's to do about. The other one is a study from, I believe it's the University of Chicago and UCLA, which has concluded that the greenhouse gas programs that California has implemented have been negated by the, the greenhouse gas emissions and black carbon emissions that come off of wildfires. So what you're seeing is this huge erosion of all of the progress we've made over the last 40 to 50 years in improving air quality because the wildfire situation is deteriorating so quickly. Um, and as we all can appreciate, you know, climate change is just exasperating that. And so from our perspective, from Placer County's perspective, it strongly points to the need for, you know, significant investment in making our forests resilient. Um, and and, and it, it speaks to the need for investments and adaptation for when wildfire events happen, just as we do when it gets really hot, just as we do when it gets really cold. We need to have some process where impacted individuals, particularly those in vulnerable communities, have some place they can go to escape the smoke impacts when they happen. And so there's a lot of efforts going on in the region for that, um, and, and certainly more needs to be done. And it's probably a much broader answer to the question, but hopefully that gets to, you know, some of the issues that wildfire really does present that not that long ago we weren't even talking about. Thank you, Eric, for, for giving a perspective about um, our region and wildfire impacts. Um, I, I believe before I move on to the chat box, um, Shamala, do you want to add anything? Right. So, so just as uh, Eric pointed out, um, because most of those uh, uh, wildfire days are uh, exempted or written off uh, in the calculation of whether uh, an area is actually meeting the standard. So that's one of the reasons why uh, the Lung Association is advocating, is uh, uh, asking for uh, the, at least for the, um, the fine particulate matter, PM 2.5 standard to be set at um, the 99th percentile. So there'll be fewer exceedance days um, days that will be uh, acceptable under the law. Thank you, Shamala. And um, just to go to the chat box, um, Ralph Popper, you, your question is, can feds do more controlled burns in national forest lands? Um, does anyone want to take that? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that, uh, Ralph. Yeah. Yes, the Forest Service can and, and, and the state and in Foster County in particular, we've been advocating for that. You know, the, the, the force, the federal government through the Forest Service has committed to um, do prescribed burning of 500,000 acres across California each year to try to reduce wildfire risk. And the state has also made a similar commitment for a total of a million acres. I can tell you that the process on uh, achieving that million, those million acres a year is is way behind. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big effort at the state level through the um, 
Forest Resiliency Task Force to try and um, uh, see that number meet that million mile goal. Uh, I'm sorry, that million acre goal, but it's been slow. So um, yes, there is an effort underway, but they're not there yet. Thanks, Eric. Um, any further questions? Just monitoring the chat. Kathy, I have I have one thing I kind of wanted to, to say if that's if that's okay. So you yes. know, we talked really about, you know, one of the challenges I think we have, and I'll tell you as a regular, one of the frustrations we have, and, and Miles has heard this as well from my sister agencies and, and other states across the country, is as EPA goes through this process of lowering the standard you know, based on, you know, very compelling health-based information. One of the challenges we have as a region, and I know my, my air district partners would attest to this, is that, that, you know, we have done a fantastic job, I believe, of reducing emissions from sources here locally, whether it's the power plants we have here, um, whether it's the cement facilities, um, whether it's the coating operations, um, to the point where, their component, their piece of the emission inventory is becoming smaller and smaller. And what we're left with are sources that for us are, are solely regulated by the federal government. And, you know, I know many of us believe that in setting these standards, um, more needs to be done by the federal government to address the sources of emissions that are solely under their control. These are things like locomotives. These are things like marine vessels. These are things like interstate trucks. And the challenge we have in meeting the, the standard is going to be that um, there are very few local sources for us to continue to regulate and, and, and tight ratchet down on until the federal government steps up and they address these federal sources as well. So to me, as we talk about a lower NAC standard, um, we have to have a, a, a parallel and comparable conversation about what is EPA going to do to address these other sources of emissions so that regions that don't meet the standards, and it's not unique to the Sacramento region, um, have a shot at meeting them on the deadlines that they've set. Um, and without that complementary piece, um, you know, at some point, the NAX is going to break in terms of it's not, we're not going to be able to meet it because the source of emissions, we just can't get to them locally. And so we do need the federal government to act part and parcel along with it. And, and I think as we as we weigh in as a region on the NACs, that piece of the conversation needs to be needs to be conveyed to them as well. I just wanted Definitely. to comment. Go ahead. I just wanted to also comment on, on that. And I agree. Uh, our ozone uh, state implementation plan did talk about the various region um, areas that we need federal action to really reduce emissions and they've been long overdue for uh, emission reductions or new standards for locomotives or aircrafts too. We have an airport here in Sacramento, a few of them. Um, so there needs to be more done at the federal level to help us, the state and local air districts meet the air quality standards. Thanks, Mariella. Um, and Susan Rainier, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I just want to tell a little story and also ask uh, something about the airport. Uh, there was a project that was um, <clears throat> voted to be annexed in for uh, Davis, which is right by the freeway near uh, Mandavi Center. And there was a professor, a PhD professor that kept saying it really wasn't a good place to put that housing unit units there so close to the freeway where the freeway goes from six lanes down to three right there and he specifically spoke about the brakes of trucks as being the worst particulates ever and that's exactly what happens there and the whole uh 80 from that point on is a gridlock maker it, it starts there with the reduction of all the uh, reduction in, in uh, lanes, then it goes on to make 80 a exit off of 80, to stay on 80. In West Sacramento, it just creates the gridlock. And I just, okay, anybody that knows me knows I'm the one that keeps saying we need to get the, the 
the freeways off the river, that's an aesthetic thing for me and a spiritual and sacred thing to me. But also it's a build back better for something that hasn't even been built good in the first place. And Sacramento is really uh, a, an example of that. And then lastly, to make it shorter, why do the planes have to fly over a Davis schoolyard with an, a, an elementary school? And they fly pretty low too, when there's a causeway right there. I would, I'd like to know if somebody knows who I can call at the airport to not have planes fly over a residential, a heavy residential area in Davis. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Susan. Um, let, let's see, let's go to, for, let's go to Mark, I believe. Hi, thanks. Um, actually, I was just gonna, my comment now is a little bit <laughs> out of place, but I was gonna just quickly add on to what Eric had said um, in terms of, just to give everyone a little bit of perspective. And first of all, I agree with everything Eric just shared in terms of you know, the, the challenges you know, as local districts in the state move forward on state implementation plans and how much is under local control. And I just thought I'd share some quick numbers. Uh, the region is in the midst of working on the 2015 ozone SIP right now. And just put in perspective, the region-wide, this isn't just Sacramento County, so this is Sacramento, Yolo Solano, Placer, El Dorado's stationary source contribution, the piece that we actually have control of, is about six tons of NOx. The actual total that we're looking at in terms of the planning is over 40. So just to put that, you know, to give numbers to what Eric was just sh sharing about how little of it is actually within local control just to explain you know, why, you know, as we are looking at new standards coming out of the federal government, um, out of EPA, you know, just where there needs to be that recognition even at the, the federal level of what is the federal government doing to step up with their share. So thank you. I just I wanted to sort of add on, just provide some numbers to that. Thanks, Mark. Any further questions or comments? I think we're just about at time. All right. I see Adrian has just popped on. Hey, hey Adrian. Um, yeah, so, so really appreciate you all. Uh, thank you for all the questions and comments. Um, we're out of time, but um, I, I do have one announcement for this group uh, before we wrap it up. Uh, we are having our quarterly Clean Air, Air Partnership Luncheon in person, which is ten tentatively scheduled for, for Friday, December 2nd from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Um, we'll be providing a delicious lunch and cookies for our guests where we'll discuss the logistics industry and heavy duty trucks. So all things heavy duty trucks. Um, so we really hope you can join us at this event and, and look out for an invite and registration link in the upcoming weeks. Um, I, I just really wanna close this meeting by, by thanking our speakers, Miles, Shamala and Mariella and Luis as well from the Portland Cement Association. Thank you so much for joining us today and providing your perspectives. Um, I also wanna thank our Cleaner Air Partnership contributors as well. Um, last but not least, I wanna thank, um, I wanna greatly thank our attendees for tuning in with us today. We'll, we'll follow up with uh, an email with resources and links relating to the topic today and, and notes from this meeting as well. Um, there will also be a recording of this meeting at our, on our Valley Vision YouTube channel, which I'll drop below. So, so look out for that in the upcoming week as well. Um, and, and before we log off, I really wanted to share a saying by Helen Keller. Um, Alone we can do so little, and together we can do so much. Um, if, and if anyone doesn't have anything further to, to comment, um, thank you, everyone, and have a great Veterans Day. Thank you. Thank you.